Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Billy Wilder Theatre. I'm Claudia Bester. I'm the Director of Public Programs here at the Hammer Museum, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to tonight's program, Glenn O'Brien, Intelligence for Dummies. Glenn O'Brien was one of the most widely read and influential magazine writer-editors over the last 50 years. He was also a Hall of Fame copywriter and creative director whose advertisements are ingrained in popular culture. O'Brien studied at Georgetown University and Columbia University and then went on to join Andy Warhol's Interview Magazine, which he helped shape over 20 years. He wrote regular columns and publications including Art Forum, GQ, Harper's Bazaar, Paper, Purple, and Spin, and was widely read on the subjects of art, fashion, and music. He was also well known for his witty advice column, Style Guy, for GQ Magazine. And he wrote dozens of books, including the 2011 bestseller, How to Be a Man, published in six countries. And unfortunately, he passed away much too young in 2017. So tonight we'll have readings from some of Glenn's essays and talk about his impact as a writer and as a magazine editor. We have four extraordinary readers here tonight reading from O'Brien's essays and discussing them. First up is novelist and critic Linda Yablonski, who's also our moderator tonight. She's covered the contemporary art world, its personalities and power structures as a journalist for 30 years with the New York Times and T Magazine, W Magazine, Art Forum, Art News, and many other publications in the US and Europe. Currently, she's a correspondent for the art newspaper, and she's writing a new book called Why Jeff Koons, covering the artist's life and career, and it'll be published in 2021. Ernest Hardy's criticism has appeared in the New York Times, The Village Voice, Vibe, Rolling Stone, The LA Times, and The LA Weekly. He's a contributor to the reference books, 1001 Movies You Must See Before You Die, and classical material, The Hip Hop Album Guide. His collection of criticism, Blood Beats Volume 1, Demos, Mixes, sorry, Demos, Remixes, and Extended Versions, was a recipient of the 2007 Pen Beyond Margins Award. Ernest has curated programs for the Hammer Museum by himself and with Tisa Bryant as the multimedia duo Black Book. His forthcoming collection of poetry and short stories will be published by Writ Large Press. Andy Spade is an American entrepreneur. He started his career in advertising, working at Shia Day on brands including Coca-Cola, Lexus, and Paul Stewart, before leaving his job in 1996 to found the fashion brand Kate Spade New York and the design company Partners in Spade with his late wife, Kate Spade. Jonathan Lethem is the author of 11 novels, including Girl in Landscape and The Feral Detective. His stories and essays have been collected in five volumes, and his writing has been translated into over 30 languages. He currently occupies the Roy Disney Chair of Creative Writing at Pomona College. So tonight's program is the brainchild of Michael Zilka, who moved to New York from London in the summer of 75. And with that, within two days, he discovered the legendary music club CBGB's, just as the punk scene was getting started. Michael founded Z Records in 1978, where he pioneered a new melding of disco and punk music. In 86, he moved to Houston and joined his father in the energy business, where they foiled, focused on oil and gas exploration and then on wind energy development. Michael started his new publishing company, Z Books, last year, and the first book from the press is Glenn O'Brien's Intelligence for Dummies. Future authors under the imprint will include Nick Flynn, Mary Gateskill, Ronnie Horn, Tessa Dean, and Claudia Rankine. So now we're going to hear from Michael about why he decided to publish this collection of essays by Glenn O'Brien. Please join me in welcoming Michael Zilka. Uh, good evening. Thank you, Claudia. And thanks so much to the Hammer for putting on this, putting this program together. It's a huge honor for a fledgling publishing company um, putting, putting out its first book to have an event here. Glenn O'Brien was a close friend of mine for 40 years. We met when I was producing records in New York and he was writing a column called New York Beat at Interview Magazine. Um, Glenn had already been an editor of, the editor of High Times and the first editor of, in, of Interview Magazine. And, um, the, uh, and when, when I started, my records didn't sell very well, so it was very important to have press um, that would say that they were good because that way my distributors kept financing me. And so Glenn was very, very important in that respect. Um, we remained friends after I, 
I moved down to Houston in 1986, and Glenn's career blossomed with regular columns in Interview, Art Forum, GQ, and Purple, m providing running commentary on music, art, politics, fashion, advertising for more than four decades. He also created a TV show, Glenn O'Brien's TV Party, with um, hosts and participants such as Jean-Michel Basquiat, Fab Five Freddy, and Blondie's Debbie Harry and Chris Stein, who were part of the house band. A lot of my bands appeared on the show, and so Glenn and I would work together that way. Um, Glenn also began working in advertising then, um, initially for Barney's, and then he was the creator of deliriously inventive and original campaigns for Calvin Klein and Chanel, amongst others. He brought the same dedication to craft for his advertising work as he did for his other writings and considered them equally important art forms. My wife Nina and I often screen Glenn's ad reel when we have friends over for movie night. It makes the whole experience more festive and cinema-like. Um, Glenn um, made a film in, in 1981, which was originally called New York Beat and then Downtown 81, which um, Marie-Paul, who is in this audience tonight, and I helped finish. Um, uh, she was the producer and I was the executive producer when we finished it 20 years later and a lot of my bands were in that. So Glenn had an incredible eye for art and was as generous in his support of artists as he was with musicians and other writers. He never lost his curiosity and love of originality. When he passed away in April 2017, I felt I wanted to honor his legacy in some way and that the best way was to do a collection of books. And then as I thought about it, if it was just one isolated book, it wouldn't have as much impact as if it was part of a series. So um, that's why I just start, decided to start Z Books, which is named after my record company, Z Records. And um, all the books have a strong visual element. And um, I hope you enjoy them. So you're going to hear four passages from Glenn's writing. And hopefully you'll look for more afterwards. Thank you so much. And Linda Yablonski is now going to come out with the um, authors. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Claudia. And thanks to the hammer. Let's get situated here. Um, and thank you all for ignoring the debate tonight and being with us instead. <laughs> Although we'll probably get around to talking about politics anyway because it's unavoidable and it's we have to be responsible. Uh, I also knew Glenn for a very long time. He was a very close friend. I miss him a lot. He was also a mentor for me uh, as a journalist, as a columnist. Uh, and um, if not for Glenn, I never would have done a crossword puzzle because <laughs> that's how we bonded was over the <laughs> New York Times crossword puzzle. But I, I knew him before that, uh, as I, I wrote an obituary uh, when he died, uh, that, and it's absolutely true, is Glenn was the kind of person I went to New York to meet. And uh, even though we were more or less the same age, and I got there before he did. Uh, it, but he did, he wrote about so many things uh, with equal facility and, and wisdom and overall, more of a wit. He wrote about politics, he wrote about art and fashion and advertising and uh, human behavior and music. And he was kind of a phenomenon that way. And how could he do that? Well, I think it's because he cared about everything. Everything mattered. He made everything matter. But he had a sense of humor about it, too, which is a, a requirement for surviving. And uh, one of the things he cared about was the way he looked and the clothes he wore. And he was a pretty natty dresser. 
in uh, there's an essay in the, in the book Intelligence for Dummies, uh, where he recounts the history of TV Party, this kind of public access uh, talk show that was on. Uh, in, I don't know how many people saw it. I mean, I had no access to it at the time. Uh, uh, but I knew about it, and I've seen it since. But it, it was the uh, cocktail party that could be a political party, but it was a TV party. And in recounting this, uh, he says that he's struck by how good everyone looked. Uh, and uh, because in the 70s, when it, it started in 1978, uh, nobody wore designer clothes, at least not in our crowd. Uh, and designers looked at us for ideas for people uptown to buy so they could look like us. And, uh, but every, nobody, no two people looked the same. And everybody had their own look and staked out their own territory and became part of this persona. So I just want to start by asking my fellow panelists here, uh, uh, Jonathan, I mean, 11 novels, what do you wear to work? <laughs> well, I, I, mean, I, uh, I can answer that. Am I, am I, am I live? There we go. Um, with this morning, I was, uh, uh, while others were in my house, were still asleep, I was writing, uh, working on a novel in, in a robe. So it's the least glamorous uh, uh, calling, avocation. I mean, you can wear you can wear anything, but s s somewhere there's a quip that it's impossible to write naked. Um, so I and I and I haven't I haven't usually tried that, but sometimes as little as a t-shirt or a, you know sweatpants. I've tried it. Yeah. How how did it go? It didn't help to work very much. <laughs> 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 what about you, Ernest? <laughs> well. I wear this when I'm teaching, and and the last um, few um, terms, my students at the end of term, you know, I will have about five or six students who will show up in coveralls as well. When I'm at home and and, and writing, you know, it's just sweats and a t-shirt, nothing remotely glamorous or natty at all. And Andy, I only write in tuxedo. I read the quote about writing naked, and I thought my writing is so terrible that I should really dress it up to improve it. Um, it usually is what I am wearing today, or I refer to one of Glenn's columns on how to dress um, for advice. Good idea. Now, I, I was asking this question for a reason, and because I'm going to read uh, uh, an essay from the book called... An it doesn't sound like it's related, but it's called Why I Still Don't Paint. I go into a gallery and see something, and right off I think, I can do better than that. I check the prices and I think, holy mackerel, but still, I'm not painting today. To do something better than someone who does, not, who, d who does it not well enough, well, that's not enough. Just because I could be a lot less terrible than some of the painters out there doesn't mean I should go out there and pick up a brush. Every once in a while, I'll read something a painter has written, a real painter, and I'll think, I'm not painting for the same reason he shouldn't be writing. I think you know who you are. <laughs> this drunk comes up to me in a bar the other night and says to me, do you model? I tell him, I don't. He asks me, why not? Here we go again. I mean, I'm sure I could make even more modeling than I don't make painting, but so what? If I modeled, would it be fair to all those models who can't write? Would drunks come up to me in bars and say, do you write? Why don't you write? Frankly, frankly, modeling appeals to me even less than painting. Dorothy Parker, asked if she liked writing, answered, nobody likes writing. People like having written or something like that. I love to write. I can do it alone. 
I can sit there and just laugh, laugh, laugh at the witty things I come up with. Sure, I'd rather play third base for the Yankees, but I know I can't do that, so I don't try. Another great thing about writing is that you can do it wearing any old thing or nothing. Although there is a McLuhanite theory that it's harder to read and write naked. I forget why. Of course, I guess you can paint in any old thing too, although a smock and beret would help me get in the mood. Maybe that's another reason I'm not a model. I couldn't say, I can't work in that. <laughs> Performers have even more to worry about. Look what's happened to musicians. It used to be enough to be able to make music. Now you have to be good at composing, playing, writing, singing, dancing, posing, and dressing, and your good visual taste has to carry over into graphics and video. It seems like too much responsibility. Today's, today's musicians just have more and more ways to go wrong. Sure, maybe you play great, but what if you've got on the wrong pants and your rhythm does not extend below your waist? I wonder if I'm the only one with nostalgia for specialization. I respect a musician that knows he can't sing or write words a performer who wears black tie because he knows he is colorblind. I just got this record by the Happiness Boys, an EP called Resident Alien from Duotone Records. It is subtitled Six Aggressive Structures for Dance. To me, that's kind of sad. I really like the music. Why do they have to tell you that it's an aggressive structure for dance? Now I'm afraid that performers think they have to be critics, too. Twyla Tharp used the Beach Boys. Did they have to call Little Deuce Coop a matrix for audiovisual interaction with choreography? <laughs> I feel sad for the Happiness Boys, and I felt sadder when I read their press release. <laughs> Quote, both Nestor and Bob command attention with the flair and style of their dress, their movement on stage, and the magnetism of their personalities. Along with their own personal appeal, the compellingly harsh images of their video, film, and slides add the final layer to a driving kinetic sound and performance." Close quote. I suppose if you knew what I was wearing, you'd enjoy reading this even more. But I'm old fashioned that way. I like for there to be a little mystery. Besides, I'm not wearing such beautiful clothes to attract attention or enhance my writing. It's to help me not paint. <laughs> One of the things I really appreciated about you, Glenn, as a writer, and a person, is uh, his lack of pretense. He wasn't precious about anything. He called the shots as he saw them, and he was usually right. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, Ernest, have you ever tried painting? No. <laughs> well, I, I, I <laughs> no, I, I'm colorblind. I can barely. I mean, I can oh, barely but dress. where's your black tie? <laughs> <laughs> but can I just say, listening to you read that, what really blew me away as a writer was just how much he said, how quickly he said it, and the incredibly insightful, biting, truthful, truthful observations he made, you know, within comedy, so that it's, you can sort of ride along the surface of it and just laugh and, and, and enjoy it, but there's some serious and really substantive um, critique being leveled as well, and that's actually really hard to do. I mean, to, to do either one, but to, to do it, um, to, to fuse them, as he did, because I'm listening and you know you, you, you would say something and it'd be very funny, and then the very next thing would be just extraordinarily biting and, and truthful commentary that applied to, you know, why do, mu why do musicians now have to, you know, be able to do 17 different things all at once? I mean, that's a, that's a real conversation, right? Um, and the way he delivered it was just so, so wonderful. It is quite economical. I think, 
I mean, I was an avid reader of Glenn's uh, column and interview, and what what's it's striking about them is this. I mean, it was supposed to be a music column, but the first half of it would be about many other things that would all somehow come together uh, as a as a a, cri a social critique and end up supporting or advocating for some new band or music or music phenomenon. And, uh, and, and not just the fact of that they existed, but uh, how one experienced them. And uh, he, uh, it's not that interview had such a huge uh, subscriber base, but as he, wrote somewhere what subscribers they managed to communicate everything in it to a much wider audience and to other publications and writers and stylists and uh, directors who picked up on it. Uh, but uh, that's uh, what also strikes me is how he could be uh, of the many things that Glenn did, we left out that he was also had a mini career as a stand-up comic, which didn't last that long or go that well, but he did it. <laughs> and he was funny at times. Uh, and uh, I think he was funnier on the page <laughs> than he was in person. But he was a performer, you know, and he would start a TV party, he was out there performing. And I think he, you know, he worked a, quite a long time for Andy Warhol and picked up a few things from, uh, in fact, he was one of the few people who were, worked in the factory who survived uh, what they call the Warhol curse, which is never to be able to escape the aura of Andy. But, uh, and Andy would go around with copies of interview and invite people to be on the cover, and that's how they got interviews with a lot of society people and celebrities. And so all Glenn had to do was go around to all the clubs and say, you want to be on TV party? And, and, and they were. <laughs> um, um, Ernest. By the way, if any of you have any questions, we are going to have a Q&A, but if you feel a spontaneous outburst coming on, <laughs> don't hold it in. Um, has it, you came to Glenn's writing as a fan. Mm -hmm. Did it push you in any direction or other? in your own writing or in actually what you paid attention to? Well, I think one of the things that, there are two writers that sort of fit me at the same time. One was Glenn O'Brien and the other was Greg Tate. And um, I sort of think of them in some ways as being like my, my, my parents um, in terms of my approach to criticism. One of the things I really admired about Glenn was just the way he could traverse so much terrain across discipline, across genre, and know what he was talking about. And I, I loved that he had this fanboy enthusiasm. And I know that fanboy is quite often used as a negative term, but I, I don't mean it negative at all. I mean just someone who truly is enthusiastic about what they're reading, watching, listening to, and can bring that enthusiasm to the page, but also fuse that enthusiasm with kind of staggering intellect. You know, um, you know I think to, to do that is so much harder than I think a lot of people realize. And especially in terms of contemporary cultural criticism, um, I, I feel that we've sort of fallen into, criticism has sort of fallen into two camps. One is this incredibly navel-gazing, you know, where you sit down to read a film review and you've got to slog through seven paragraphs of someone's trauma-laden family backstory before you even get to mention of the film, right? Um, and the way in which he could write in first person and get that first person immediacy without it being cloying, without it being simply narcissistic, um, was a huge influence on me because I, I thought that's what I want. I want people to read my stuff and to feel that kind of warmth and engagement, but I'm not interested in you reading my diary, right? And the way he managed to, to do that was a huge influence. And, you know, as a, as a black writer, there, so often you're so limited in, in what you are 
assigned what pitches will be picked up and to read a writer who just had that much space to write about seemingly anything he was interested in, which, which was not something that was, was not an option for a lot of black writers at that time, and, and even still, to be honest. And so um, to have that as a template was, was, um, was huge. I, I would not, I don't think of black writers as being limited. But, oh, but, oh, yes. But I, yes, yes. I don't have that, ex I mean, I, I have that experience often. But I understand what you're saying. It is better now, no? It's uh, somewhat better, but I, I don't do a lot of criticism now, but I do follow a lot of younger um, black writers, and uh, you know, a lot of the struggles that I had in the 80s and 90s, they're still having. Um, so, you know, we've moved forward a couple of inches, perhaps, but there's still so much. There's still so much that, um, especially if you are a black writer and you're not interested in quote unquote the topics that you, as a black writer, are expected to be interested in. You know. Um, you know, black writers can write about fine art, black writers can write about classical music, black writers can write about ballet. They don't get those options, they don't get those opportunities. And so um, there is still quite a lot of narrow casting for, for black writers, yeah. And, and, you know, and again, one of the things being influenced by Glenn was just seeing that as a writer, you know, you could push against the expectation of who you were and what you would be interested in. Well, I have to say, I'm glad to hear you say this, but it's, I think, the most forceful writing and criticism or fiction, present company accepted, uh, is coming from black writers today. Well, you know, I, mean, I think there's some truth to that, but one of the things that I know is that the, the battles that you have to go through behind the scenes to get that work out there um, is still immense. And there's, there still is, you know, um, sort of a, a narrowing of the lanes by external forces as opposed to what your own interests are and what your own abilities are. Yeah. Either of you want to comment on this? I, I, would, uh, I, would, I would comment uh, that question <laughs> as a black writer I no, I feel that I or we are better at criticism um, I I felt that you know he I met him through advertising and again like Ernest I coming from from that side he made me proud to be a, a copywriter I actually was introduced to his work uh, I met him as a judge of an advertising award show very prestigious advertising award show, you should know, um, as if there's such a thing. But he made, his work for Barney's um, really made me proud to be uh, a copywriter. And after having met him and discovering more of his work, the way that he actually uh, kind of mentored me and without knowing that uh, he showed me I could cross disciplines and encouraged me to um, to take photographs, and I have to say, uh, I do paint a little bit, but I've never shown one of my paintings to Glenn because I've read that piece, you know, before <laughs> I showed him anything that I had done, and, and um, I'm glad I never did. But he always, I love that he always considered himself a writer, and a lot of people have eight titles, and he, he, he could easily, you know, consider himself to be a, an artist and a... Uh, a writer, and I'm sure he could have painted very well. Um, I curated, or he curated a show at one of my galleries, which was fantastic. Um, and I did see his stand-up act, and it All was right. wonderful. I'm going to interrupt you for a second because <laughs> I wanted to address the qu what Ernest was saying, and so I want to ask: uh, Have you worked with black copywriters? Are there black writers in advertising? There are black writers in advertising, and yes, I have, and some fantastic black writers in advertising, but not, not many, quite frankly. And why is that? Because, as Ernest said, there are plenty of talented writers who know what they're doing. 
I don't know the answer to that, quite frankly. Um, and one particular good friend of mine named Charles Hall, very successful <laughs> copyright I've worked with for several years, um, and a, a few others. Um, I think that like a lot of industries, you know, the, the male advertising, was, there were a lot of white males in the advertising business, and there still are. Um, like a lot of in industries today, and it's you know not changing quickly enough. Really? I don't believe so. <laughs> what can we do about it? Right now? <laughs> I, I'm hiring. <laughs> <laughs> if Ernest would, would take a freelance job, I'd be happy to have him do some work for me. <laughs> Please wait for the mic. Please wait for the mic. Thank you. Uh, Edward Goldstein is my name. And I remember years ago uh, on, I think it was PBS, uh, this guy was talking about sending out resumes and attempting to get a job. His name, his first name was Jamal. And he kept getting rejected time after time. And uh, then he realized what the issue was. He was a white man with the name Jamal and everyone thought he was black. So he shortened his name to James and immediately, based on his resume, got a job. So there's, I mean, there's built-in prejudice uh, against women, against people of color. And, you know, in the film industry, it's the same thing. You have fewer women uh, or no women in the Oscars or, uh, or Golden Globes. And so it, it's, it's, you know, built-in uh, xenophobia, racism, whatever it is. But there are a lot more opportunities for people of color and women now in terms of writing because people can self-publish now. And, it, and race doesn't really enter into it at that point when you're self-publishing your own books and then you, you know, work on marketing. So that's what my point is. Thank you. Yes, you can self-publish, but you can't self-distribute. Uh, that's, that's the issue with any, any book yeah. situation. Jonathan, you want to add anything? Let's hear the next yeah. bit of Yeah, okay, I agree. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> your shot. So I'm reading from I Remember Jean-Michel because I think that... Um, Downtown 81, which was you know, re-released some years ago and has become a sort of a cult thing, and um, Basquiat um, be having become the icon, the art world icon that he has, which I don't think anyone could have predicted at, you know, at one point in his career. Um, so I wanted to just sort of um, read through some of Glenn's memories of, of Jean-Michel. Every once in a while, Jean-Michel stars in one of my dreams. He always looks good, his skin clear, eyes white. Usually he has his antler dreadlocks on. One time he told me he was feeling a whole lot better, but he couldn't visit for too long because he was on his way to Chicago. He told me that if I ran into any of his friends who owed him money, that he still wanted it back. In one dream, he was painting outdoors at an easel without a shirt on. He told me he was cold. It wasn't the first time he told me that in a dream. Maybe you still feel your body over there and you feel how cold it is. Or maybe it takes even longer to shake a Jones in the Twilight Zone. I remember when we got stopped by the cops in Harlem at 3 a.m. I said, don't worry, they can't search us, it's not legal. He said, the cops can do anything they want. And this was before Michael Stewart died in handcuffs. I remember John michel drawing a crown on the back of my motorcycle jacket. I think I had the first tagged jacket in town. It made me feel even more like a king than usual and I still feel that way. I remember Jean-Michel sold a small painting at the fun gallery that he said it took him 10 minutes to do it. He figured he was making $60,000 an hour. I remember Jean-Michel had every Hitchcock film money he could buy. I remember Jean-Michel saying boom all the time. It was an exclamation point with right on built in. Boom, boom, boom for real. It was better than Warner Wolf saying swish. I remember going to a Chi-Chi party with Jean and some, right, some rich guy coming over to us and saying to him, 
And what do you do? Zhuang said earnestly, I'm the manager of McDonald's. And the guy just turned and walked away. I remember the way he talked, soft but really fast and forceful, urgent, you might say. With Zhang Michel, everything was urgent. I remember the way he danced. I remember the way he laughed. I remember when I was dope sick and Bobo Shaw beat me out of $100. Zhang Michel did a Bobo drawing. Every time I need to feel like a fool, I look at it. I remember Jean Michel calling someone a bad fool. I don't know if he made up that expression, but he certainly made it his own. And it was a merciless and infallible judgment. I remember Jean Michel hanging out with Danny Rosen. They were the two most exquisitely judgmental people I've ever met, both walking a razor's edge between cynicism and idealism, breaking the hearts of every girl and half the boys they met. I remember Danny Rosen cleaning windshields on Bowery and Houston, wearing a tuxedo. Not long after that, after that, Danny became a commercial fisherman, and when Jean Michel's ship came in, he bought Danny a commercial fishing boat. I remember one night, late in the history of the club, we showed up at the front door, and they wouldn't let us in. This was unbelievable. Finally, the doorman said that no blacks were allowed in that night. They were trying to keep the drug dealers out. Outraged, we called up Steve. He came down and let us in the club and then worked the door himself until 4 a.m. I remember the first night I met Valda at the Mud Club. She said to me, I crave you. I didn't know what to do. I think she might have said the same thing to Jean-Michel later, and he seemed to know what to do. <laughs> I remember Jean-Michel's eyelashes very, very well. I remember making Jean-Michel a movie star. He spoke so softly he was almost a silent movie star, but he had that star quality. I remember that the co-producer, Patrick Montgomery, calling him Jean-Michel Boy. He didn't take it too well. Later, Patrick made a movie about the Beatles. I remember Jean-Michel always had great pot. I usually had great pot, too. Sometimes we had great pot smoke-offs. I remember Jean-Michel painting big canvases on the floor and walking all over them. I remember Jean-Michel painting a big canvas on the wall and nodding out in mid brushstroke for 30 seconds and then picking up right where he left off. Because of his skin, people thought he had AIDS. He told me he didn't. William Burroughs said he told him he did. I don't think he did. I think he might have mentioned it to me before Burroughs, although Burroughs is a bit more priestly than me. And maybe Burroughs fancied him gay. He wasn't gay. He might have slept with a guy at some time or another, but it wasn't me. Nobody else told me they did. When somebody asked Tulula Bankhead if Montgomery Clift was gay, she replied, he never sucked my dick. <laughs> he had two portraits of himself in his studio. One was an oxida oxidation painting by Andy, a piss portrait, and one was a self-portrait. He thought that they were prophetic because he painted himself missing a front tooth, er, front tooth, and shortly thereafter, it got knocked out. Then Andy pissed on his metallic silk screen and splotches oxidized on his face, and then he got them, boom, for real. I remember being mad at him when he moved into the studio on Great Jones, renting it from Warhol. It was because it meant that my friend Walter Steeding wouldn't be able to live there for free anymore. I myself wrote some unkind graffiti on the door, but it was only there for a couple of days before it got sprayed over. I felt stupid about it later and enjoyed hanging out there with Jean-Michel. It was kind of a weird place though, especially when Jean died, died there and then Eric, the brother of Jean's ex-girlfriend, took it over for his studio. I just remember passing the studio a couple of days after Jean blasted off and seeing this beautiful little voodoo shrine attached to the door. It was a lot better than any headstone. I remember him painting a painting that was so great and then just painting over it, and that was so great. Thank you, Ernest. Uh, I think uh, this piece is a little different from every everything else that, that's in this book. Uh, do you want to tell me why you chose to do this? Well, it was interesting to me because, as I said before, one of the things I really admired was the way Glenn's writing was able to give you the sort of immediacy and, and connection of 
first person voice even when he didn't write in first person voice and so I sort of I wanted to go into this one because I liked the way he wrote in first person voice and in doing so gave you a real sense of who he he was as a person and writer but also managed to capture who Jean-Michel was as well so um you know to to use first person voice in a way that was expansive and to do it in a way that illuminated the subject the beyond yourself was really interesting to me because as you said, um, this is a piece that's a little different than other pieces in the book and I thought what he did in, the, in, the, in this piece and how he did it was, was really interesting. Well, I, I actually think of this piece as a poem and, and Glenn was a poet and he was very influenced by particularly New York school and beat poetry and this was a, you know, modeled on Joe Brainerd's I Remember. Uh, and uh, I also think it's a very accurate portrait of Jean-Michel and the time they lived in. Were you about to say something? I was just thinking about the Joe Brainerd uh, yeah. um, reference that the entire piece, um, uh, I mean, it, 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 um, it seems to me that one of the th one of the subjects of the piece is also encoded in that gesture, which is that it's about uh, uh, art making as a participation in a field of sort of social practice, of associations and 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 communications among people who are uh, within reach of each other. You know, I mean, and I'm. You know, is it really interesting to talk about getting out from under Warhol's? Uh, auspice, right? I mean, um, and or uh, eluding the, the Warhol curse because, and even in this piece, there's this passive aggressive push pull, you know, in a way he and Warhol might have been sort of uh, kind of squabbling over a kind of proprietary excitement about Basquiat. But they're also, um, you know, uh, doing, uh, participating in, in the, um, the, f the field of social practice in the city at the time and, and not excluding next generations. So, so Warhol and, and, and O'Brien have the same relation to Basquiat in, in one sense. You know, uh, I, I was just so glad you read the, read the piece because it evokes so much of that. Um, the world that I first came to be conscious of, of O'Brien in was precisely because of this interest in people I mean, my age, essentially, you know, and that they w that 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 was it wasn't a closed um, avant-garde kind of uh, pantheon of uh, you know uh, you know people who've accomplished such and such, and then after us, no more. Instead, it was an open, rolling. Uh, you know, that's what TV Party felt like too. It was uh, who else is out there? Who's going to teach us what's uh, newer than us? You know, and can we get them on the show? Can we put them in the magazine? Um, can we hang out with them? Uh, you know, that's all in this piece as well. Um, you know, I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't think of O'Brien first as a writer, although I was reading him. I was reading him with a kind of a byline blindness that came from being a teenager in New York. I read The Village Voice in an interview, and I didn't think about who was writing the words. I just was wanting to know what, what was happening, you know. And then what was happening started to connect to um, the world that I was inhabiting, you know, I, I um, well, I mean, my, you know, uh, Basquiat was a graffiti artist before, before he was sort of a, a painter, and of course he remained one in many ways, um, and you know that was true, true of Keith Haring too. But we used to see, you know, as teenagers in Glenn O'Brien's and Andy Warhol's city, we used to see uh, Samo slogans. <laughs> And get excited and quote them to each other, and you know, and and some of us, you know, knew Basquiat or knew people who knew him, and so then when he was, uh, not adopted, but just when he when he you know suddenly was this electrical current connecting to something like the the Warhol factory or to uh, Interview magazine or to, or was in the uh, downtown eighty one, we understood that the world we were in was this world, and Glenn O'Brien was. Um, was you know it was, it was a radical openness to the the social field that made that visible. Um, we used to see Keith. Her I'm just just an anecdote. We used to see Keith Haring's 
uh, chalk drawings on the, you know, his, his beginning was when the advertisements weren't up in the, in the subway stations, there would be a black backdrop. It was like a framed black, almost like a chalkboard. And he had the idea that it was a chalkboard and he started making these chalk drawings. But because we were graffiti writers and we were, we were proprietary about certain subway stations, if we saw Herring's chalk drawings in our station, we would smear them with our hands. You know, I must have destroyed by certain gallerists measure, you know, $10,000 worth of Keith Herring drawings just, just on my way past them out of annoyance, you know. Um. I'm sure it's millions and not thousands. <laughs> but I, I also have to say that neither Jean-Michel nor Keith thought of themselves as graffiti artists, and they weren't. Jean was writing poetry on the walls. Uh, th they were, uh, you know, his friend from high school wrote the, did the imagery, but, uh, and, and he did the... Yeah. What? Yes, Algiers, and uh, the copyright symbol, I can't remember which one thought of that, but uh, it was really striking, and the first thing I thought, and I think many people thought when they saw the same o, I mean, we call it graffiti for lack of a better word, there were, there were poems, was how striking the words were. The language the, was marvelous, and, yeah. Yeah, and... You know, he didn't, uh, Jean didn't make a painting until 1981, and these were all happening in the 70s. Uh, and uh, Keith was clearly not doing graffiti. I mean, it looked like art. Even the, the it, it looked like something, I mean, the graffiti, the kind you saw in bathrooms and in the subways, not the Keith's drawings, but on the, the, uh, the posts, the iron posts, or you know, on the subways themselves, in the interior or the outside, with Lee Canonis and sometimes Fab Five Freddy, were making murals, moving murals that would change as they went by you. Uh, that was something else, and uh, that was happening at the very, at the very moment that hip hop and break dancing began. It was all part of the same culture, the uh, punk and new wave, and. Uh, the energy was phenomenal, and it fed into it, fueled everything around the, the clothes, writing, filmmaking. It was all part. It was one. There, there wasn't an art world. It was one big world, as you were just saying, and we were all in it, and lucky to be. And the culture we have today came from that. I think. It, yeah. I, I think also one thing that really struck. Well, struck me about Glenn when I first met him in the 80s was a lot of the, the history. Uh, I unfortunately was not around during those days. I moved to New York in 1986, but the, his curiosity never stopped and he continued on. Uh, he took me to meet Tom Sachs and Richard Prince years and years ago when they were first starting their careers. Um, the Safdie brothers, who just put out the movie Uncut Gems, we were mentioning in the in the in the back room there. He wrote about them very early on when they started. Casey and Van Neistat. His curiosity never stopped. So a lot of people talk about the the days, you know, interview and Basquiat, and I, you know, fantasize and kind of the, the nostalgia of that. You know, I romanticize about that. But he continued to look and seek out you know, new stars. I remember him saying. Where are the new Basquiat? Where are the new thinkers in New York today? And um, that always impressed me that um, he continued to you know, look for those people um, and discover them. And as you said earlier, you know, write about them before a lot of people recognize their, their, their whatever it is they had. There was someone here who had their hand raised. Please wait for the mic. Oh, oh, oh me? I was. Marginal. Uh, you wouldn't. You, I I had a couple of different things I, I wrote. My brother was the was the um, Keo, yeah. And you can find his, the lore of his work, but not mine. You would and yeah. I was a I was a tagging tagging along, not really tagging. <laughs> um, we talk a lot today about hipsters, which is a kind of phenomenon of the. Last, I mean, hipsters aren't new, 
but the way people think of it today seems to have originated in the 2000s. What's the difference between hip and cool? Hip is a bone. What? Hip is a bone, cool is a temperature. I think he did. I think it is. Let's hear what Glenn. Let's hear what Glenn had to say about that subject. Yeah, yeah. I think the answer lies within. I was fortunate to know Glenn for about twenty years or twenty-five years. Um, do I speak to this microphone or this one? Does it matter? You can hear me. Okay, great. So I wanted to read the piece that Linda read. I love that piece on why I don't paint. But I'm reading notes on hip. And just so everyone knows that this was written in 1987. So the word that was used uh, f for the word hip, which I don't know what the word is today, maybe some of the audience does, uh, was stupid is what people refer to as hip. So if you don't be confused when you hear this. Notes on hip. I've been asked, what's hip? It's a stupid question, but then again, stupid is the new fresh, the highest of hip compliments, the hip word for hip. Stupid is the new cool and the new hip, so dig it. You want to be hip? Be stupid. It's easy, but it can be art, too. To be hip, as long as there has been a hip to stand on, has been to be where it's at, pointed toward where it's all going. Hip is the posture of the futuristic elite, who are living today in tomorrow's standards, ideals, and ideas. To be hip is to be live in the future, at least 20 minutes or more. And to be hip is to possess the attributes of the future as they are perceived from where it's at. That may mean being cool, being radical, being casual, being fresh, or as we now are seeing more and more, being stupid. Today, the art of being stupid would seem to be where hip is at. Of course, here, as in any hip movement, there's going to be a whole spectrum of stupid. And no doubt our readers, already into the basics of stupid, want to know about the esoteric, elegant, exquisite, upscale forms of stupid that constitute the new stupidity. What's the stupidest? Who are the stupid elite? Yo, dig? What's stupid is the question behind all contemporary magazine journalism, not to, not to mention most human behavior. And the answer to this question, and the answers to this question are not only fictional, they are also secrets. Spilling the beans must be done very gradually and at a very good rate of exchange. Some things are better left unsaid, like hip. But out there in the highways and byways, people are dying to be hip. And although we may be overpopulated, I'm not into encouraging death by hipness. It's a leading cause of death among the youth. That's faux hip, phony hip, the wrong idea. That's stupid, stupid. Expecting to answer to an answer to what's hip is like Hamlet asking to be or not to be, and then like York's skull, skull speaks up and says, yeah, but like how, man, like, like how? In pre-Columbian Mexico, the cats who had their hearts cut out on top of the pyramids were known as hipsters. These teen idols were well-paid and retained publicists. They were known as fresh and stupid. Today, hip has changed title. It's still a concept of an occult elite. It is primal, primitive, and metaphysically unavoidable. If you're not hip yourself, you still have a hip twin in a parallel universe, your bad self. Hip is all too often the cause of an existential leap of faith from the Brooklyn Bridge that was once just sold. It's not hip to talk about hip. It's worse than the weather. Everybody talking about it and then trying to do something about it, and it's still just the same. If you have to try, you ain't. It's not a matter of choice. The leopard can't change its spots, and the beaten it can't change his goatee. Hip, like nobility, is inherited, but sometimes it skips a few generations. And you inherit it from yourself. Hip can be acquired, but only by, the, by establishing a karmic claim to the estate. Hip is mysterious. Sometimes it doesn't appear until adulthood. Sometimes it disappears altogether soon after its appearance, making the formerly hip person seem, in retrospect, to have been the victim of himself. The mechanism of hip is like the mechanism of possession because you can't own it. You can't hang it on the wall. You can only tune it in and stay tuned in. Maybe somebody acting remarkably cool for a short period of time has been temporarily possessed by Eric Dolphy or Fats Waller. 
Hip is a noun, a verb, and an adjective. Hiply is the ad adverb. Hip is a joint. When hips get together, they do the bump. They also do the hip shake. When a hip gets off and smoked, it's a ham. And the hip bone is connected to the thigh bone, and the thigh bone is connected to the knee bone, and the knee bone is connected to the triumph of the will, and the triumph of the will is connected to the G-spot, and the G-spot is connected to the communion of saints, et cetera, et cetera. You dig? Hip is in the know, and for that reason, hipness is often identified with, I can't even, I can't even pronounce this word, G-N-O-S-T-I-C-I-S-L-M, and more recently, with Rastafarianism. Hip is like a secret society because you can only be known to be hip by the hip. Others can be told you are hip and believe you are hip, but only those who are hip will know you are hip. Loose lips sink hips. I'm in with the in crowd. I go where the in crowd goes. I'm in with the in crowd. I know what the in crowd knows. Publicity for hipness can and usually does work against hipness because it tends to impute hipness to the beliefs of others, i.e. the public. When actual hipness is a form of knowledge possessed by and of, of oneself, recognized by others possessed of that knowledge, that is entirely independent of the beliefs of the public, even though hipness is often the matrix of the faux hep or bogus hipster. I don't even know what that means. Hip may be the white Negro update. The Beastie Boys are the latest of that and totally stupid. Or hip might be some dude locked inside listening to Chet Baker and making a killing in the futures market. All hip is, is a little island of enlightenment, real, unreal, alleged. Hip is a majority of one, a minority of millions. It's a free form, Freemasonry established by eye contact, sportswear, rhythm, and jokes. When you're wrong, you're automatically hip for hours weeks or years at a time, but hip is fleeting. It fades just like its physical counterpart, bloom. You can be young without being hip, but you can't be hip without being young. You can stay young as long as you're hip. When you're in with the in crowd, it's easy to find romance everywhere people stare, because we ain't square. We make every minute count. Our share is always the biggest amount. To be hip is to be hypnotic or to be hypnotized. When you're hip, you give people the eyeball and they get the message. When you're hip, you're full of suggestions that people love to follow. Or you'll follow somebody anywhere. Other guys imitate us, but the original is still the greatest. Hip is to be the wild thing. You make everything groovy. When you're hip, you don't live on the edge, but you know somebody who does, who is just a phone call away. When you're hip, you live in the middle. You eat right, look good, and play hardball. When you're hip, you're more like, you're, you're more than fresh, you're unpicked. When you're picked, you're aboriginal operating on your original DNA programming, shooting the curl of the bioplasmic flow. When you're hip, you're so casual, you're actually casual. When you're hip, Uncle Sam is looking for a few good you. When you're hip, you're down by the law of nature. When you're hip, you're word. Hipness is word upmanship. When you're hip, you're fly. You can bird land all night long. Hips can go bump into the night. When you're hip, you're intense but chill. When you're hip, you're bad. As in good, bad, but not evil. When you're hip, you're always wearing shades to protect others from your own brilliance. <laughs> hip is its own reward and its own downfall. Hip can be hip or totally unhip. But when you're hip, you don't give a flying buttress for any of that hip cha-cha-cha. You've got bigger red herrings to sushi. After that, let them eat pie in the sky a la mode. Interview Magazine, 1987. It's striking to me how much of our language and, and kind of vernacular everyday slang comes from jazz musicians, the way they talk to each other. I used to hang out with a lot of jazz musicians when I was much, 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 much younger. And because I was, well, I loved what they did, but it was the way they talked that really fascinated me. And uh, the way it filtered down into everyday speech everywhere. And I think hip hop later did exactly the same thing, only uh, with a greater effect. Uh, how much does the way people, the, the neologians and the, uh, kind of, uh, it's almost like using 
the wrong word, but in the right way <laughs> to describe an experience or a phenomenon or a, a, a person. How much does that affect how we behave with each other? Just the way you talk, the language you're using that isn't, that is not, you know, just like everyday written English. You ever made up words? <laughs> oh, have you ever made up words that you that, I, my, my that caught on? <laughs> always are isolating them, and and so I've have I I know I have, but um, not not in the sense that um, not in not in the sense of uh, a, a currency, uh, in, an interpersonal or or social currency, more more in searching for. Um, uh, uh, way to describe something that I, I don't understand. I, I don't think it's the same thing as as what you're describing about about the musicians. Um, well, there's a certain economy of language that mm -hmm. they use. Yeah, but, I mean it's compression yeah. and code, yeah. and it's a yeah. way of uh, you know um, of uh, measuring energy in 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 and in, in, in interplay. I mean it's it. Uh, Music is a is a is a language uh, created in a you know in a in an extremely small microcosm of uh, of of compatriots, and in a way, a, a a a language code is like a larger musical space that other people can play inside. A coded language is really a way of carving out a territorial identity, kind of a mutually exclusive club, whatever you want to call it. And then when that language becomes mainstream, then it kind of waters itself down and is no longer hip. So uh, that's part of the way, I mean, any club, any group, they have their own lingo to kind of uh, exclude others from their uniqueness. But I was just thinking how... Uh, how how stupid evolved into dope. <laughs> if you think about it, everything is dope. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I don't uh, think that uh, the kind of slang that we're talking about is exclusionary. It's, uh, it's just a reinvention of everyday speech. I feel like it, I, I like that piece because he, I don't remember stupid being dope or Hip being stupid, being hip. I remember fresh being fresh. Um, and currently, I don't know what is whatever, f fill in the blank. But it, he was, I thought it was a fun play on, you know, just commenting on obviously all of these trends that go on. And there's, it's almost like Mercury, you can't ever really be. Hip, and if you say it, you're not it. And he played with it a way that acknowledged that he was, um, which is virtually impossible to do. Well, yeah, I mean, Ernest, you were talking about how you can say more serious things sometimes without by by um, using a kind of ruefulness or a undercutting, self undercutting. You know, and that piece is um, it's completely uh, making fun of himself for even raising the subject. And half of that piece is like song lyrics from the 1950s. I mean, in with the in crowd. Yeah. It's really saying, uh, I don't have any idea what I'm talking about. You know? Exactly. Yeah. And I asked. Uh, when w listening to that piece, which is so great, it made me think of the, the really great Johnny Mitchell quote, uh, where she says, hip is a hurt mentality. You know? um, and I was just thinking, listening to you read that, I was thinking that how easily that line could slide in there as well, you know. But from Johnny Mitchell, it's a much more <laughs> dismissive <laughs> gesture, <laughs> right? But um, it was it was hard for me to honestly to read that piece because it was hard to follow. And having worked with Glenn and uh, advertising, we would brainstorm, and it was fun because ideas bounce back and forth when you're working on a 
on an advertising concept, and 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 his he he was very fast, I and mean, he wrote very fast. It was surprising. I found out that's why I charged by the uh, project uh, instead of by the hour. But we, um, I remember a story. I think he told me about an editor who worked at Condé Nast magazine who tried to create a trend, and she had cut a hole in the back of her hat, she was wearing a fedora, and put her ponytail through it, and she wore it for about three weeks in a row. And uh, looking through, she walked into her office one day, and no one picked up on this on this trend she was trying to set. And everyone was, was watching her. I think Glenn was there, and my wife was there, or somebody, or some kind of ass editors. And they watched her look in the mirror and slowly put it on, and then take it off, then look sideways, take it off, and then slowly take it off, and just set it down. She never put it on again. And, and uh, I, I was thinking of Glenn when I when I read that piece and that that, that trying to t trying to be hip or trying to step out, he always to me had the correct balance of knowing what was going on, acknowledging, you know, what, for example, he, he would go to Supreme, you know, and then go to you know, Turnbull and Astor. Right? It was just his his understanding of combining all of these different you know, genres to me was was interesting. Uh, in a way that others I, I didn't understand. I was asking about the language because Jonathan's selection sure, yeah, addresses I, that directly. I so do it. can yeah. you read it? So one of the things that um, I, I loved reading, reading the pieces in this book and under understanding the breadth of uh, O'Brien's uh, writing was that his uh, his antenna for style made him an incredible, pol like prescient political writer. When he thought when he thought about the way politicians self present in in um, in language and and in and in and in style and in in um, you know he he was he was. Uh, pretty angry about the things he's writing about here, but there's also, again, this kind of compassion and also ruefulness uh, because he's he's so acknowledging of um, the irrational uh, elements in American identity, I think, and in um, uh, people's appetite to be, I don't know, commiserated with or represented in some way. Um, so it's a long piece. What I, I was talking uh, about picking it back back stage and you know he wrote obviously he wrote advertising. He was very good with compressed language, aphoristic language, very tight pieces for mag short magazine lengths. But this was written for a blog and it it's uh, in a way it's a cascading piece. It it goes on for a while and I'm only going to read part of it. Um, because it takes even a while to, I think, to get really get going. But it's about Sarah Palin. Um, and he's responding on, on, at the moment that she'd emerged. You know, she, uh, you can, uh, there are clues in the piece, even if you don't look at the date, that she's just been picked by McCain. And so this is uh, a, a flash diagnostics of the way she's functioning in the culture. Um, uh, it, it, I, the setup is he analyzes uh, George W. Bush as a kind of fake man of the people, someone who created his Texas identity, and 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 then so this p piece on Sarah Palin walks in on the contrast. But Sarah Palin is the genuine article. She didn't have to work to be ordinary. She was born that way, and she is so ordinary that she represents a sea change in American politics. She is the ultimate political candidate for a political system that resembles American Idol. She is far closer to Claire, Clay Aiken than she is to Hillary Clinton. What is proclaimed as her strength and virtue is her very averageness, a local beauty contest mis, mis congeniality, a mother married to a working stiff, a newcomer to passports who doesn't live in a McMansion, who hunts and fishes and minds the kids while somehow juggling chief executive duties the way other moms juggle PTA duties. Somehow her ordinariness and lack of distinction and achievement are now considered to be a key manifestation of the democratic ideal. Palin's principal qualification is that she realistically represents the masses. The pitch selling her qualification is that of the failures of Washington. Excuse me, the fail that is, is that the failures of Washington are attributable to educated elites. To achieve real democracy, we need someone who is ordinary in every way. 
someone who has someone the little people can identify with, someone who hasn't been tainted by Harvard or foreigners. Palin is presented as not particularly gifted, educated, wealthy, or beautiful, but is entirely genuine. Her utter averageness is her greatest strength. So to pick on Palin is to pick on the American people. The Republicans are traditionally the party of the moneyed elite, and, and though and through perhaps the smoothest bait and switch in history, they continue to serve this constituency covertly while descrying their actual agenda. Posing as the party of the people, the party of, the, the party of patriotism and supporting the troops, they've forged an unholy coalition of the religious, the gun-toting, the xenophobic, and the resentful, white, silent majority, railing against bigger, big government while quietly inflating it. So this is, you know, 2008. By appealing to the fears of the great middle, they advance the agenda of the ultra-elite super-wealthy. But with Palin, they have kicked their posture up a notch, adopting the ultimate faux-populist stance by suggesting that the leadership of the extraordinary is a failed idea and that true democracy is achievable only by giving the absolutely average their shot at running things. And in a masterstroke of repositioning, they have recruited this paragon of puppetry to charm the masses. Um, Okay, I'm going to jump. So then she returns to Bush's language to set up his analysis, which is what I really want you to hear of Palin's speech. Um, Bush's slips and malapropisms seem comic, putting food on your family. We look forward to hear your vision, etc. But Bush's gaffes are not simply the comic errors of a man who disdains academic grammar, elevated tone, and highfalutin usage in favor of the all-American Vulgate. His style is a conscious deconstruction of meaning, the replacement of a language of precision by a language of ambiguity or even ruse. It's not easy to achieve meaninglessness in the context of government and statesmanship. Palin goes beyond malapropism into a language of pure gibberish into double talk that resembles the comedy of Professor Erwin Corey, who satirized the elevated jargon that academic elites employ to convey an impression of importance that is all flash and no substance. Palin's syntax is not that of the English language, but a new kind of language in which conventional structure is replaced by blocks and stacks of code and buzzwords, pre-digested button-pushing button ideograms that simulate speech but are in fact its opposite. This new form of communication, more signifying than communicating, is not new. The neoconservatives have been developing this code in the precincts of Karl Rove and Rush Limbaugh, but Palin is the new grandmaster of this radical, almost cubistic, conservative brand of post-logical rhetoric. It goes beyond double talk, into circumlocution combined with Barrosian cut-up strategies so that logical thought is short-circuited and meaning can never proceed in conventional linear fashion. A sentence or its equivalent, begins conventionally. But then, when the electrically charged keyword is reached, it is as if a switch is flipped and a tangent kicks in, negating the previous logical track while appearing to complete it. In Palin's discourse, there are no actual diagrammable sentences. Instead, the governor speaks in sententious paragraphs of scrambled, cut-up cliches, run-on sentences, and collaged clauses, stringing them together like signal flags flapping from a warship. One listens with a sort of horror as Palin simulates speech. Surely, surely others recognize that this is not language as usual. Surely the interviewer knows. But then a suspicion begins to take shape, a suspicion that to many listeners this dance of words is recognized as meaningful. It doesn't conform to any of the rules of grammar or logic, but it serves as an acceptable substitute for those to whom grammar and logic are not essential in communication. I wonder what interlocutors like Katie Couric or Charles Gibson really think and feel when listening to this performance, when they recognize that their interviewee is completely perplexed in the face of their questions, either entirely baffled or unprepared to respond, but then correspondents such as these are prohibited from freely questioning the nature of her mode of response for fear that they will be characterized as biased elitists and or sexists who misunderstand and disparage the folksy colloquial style of the Alaska governor. But what if she is not dissembling in this mismatch? Mi mis mishmash of hers. What if it is, what is it she is doing when she speaks in cut-up tongues? What if she is invoking avenging angels using Aleister Crowley's parsing? What if she is summoning Baal and Basilbub? Uh, 
Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Michael, do you want to come up and join us? And uh, if anybody has a comment or a question uh, about any of this uh, to ask us, we are here at your service. Surely you must have a feeling. Hi. Oh, hi. Oh, hi. Hi. Uh, I'm a musician. Um, are there any other musicians in the room? No. Oh, wow. So, so he was right. Glenn was right. Um, I have the proud honor of being reviewed and interviewed for two of my bands. And he also wrote the liner notes for one of my albums. And I just would like to ask Michael, you know, maybe you should do the next book with the writings that he did for all the musicians that wouldn't have done otherwise without him. It's a lovely idea, and I think <coughs> Gina, Glenn's widow, who is here, is planning <coughs> other collections. <coughs> what I'm doing with Z Books is something very specific. I see. <coughs> there, it's kind of, I, I've realized after this one that people buy best ofs, but they don't buy rarities and b-sides collections <laughs> so <laughs> um, and this is a best of um intelligence for dummies but but there is, is so much there but it's it's revisiting writings of some of my heroes and doing it um with a visual element because if you look at this book intelligence for dummies the the words are beautiful but the book as an object is also very very beautiful and there's lots of imagery in it and so i think this was my glenn statement but i hope you know maybe if if i manage to establish z books then i then i can do other things and um i think it's, and I, like it's that. touched us all yeah I, mean, I i wasn't available for any memorials for glenn so tonight is Right. Oh, <laughs> Tonight is it for me, well, but I wanted to thank you. Yeah, it's very moving yeah. for me too, and and um, and hearing the words especially, that's thank what you. really matters. Thank you. I I would like to ask um, if anyone in the audience, you know, hearing the the pieces that were read, they're very very different. You know, they're in different registers of music, they're in different registers of thought. And I'm just re really curious, for those of you in the audience, you know. What threads do you pull from, you know, through the different pieces, if any, and how how do you, you know, what emerges for you, listening to the sort of very different um, pieces, but they're all Glenn, and how that re how that manifests for you, what you hear, and and what what you take away from, you know, those different notes and the and the different kinds of music that he he made with with language and with thought. If, if anyone has any thoughts on that. I think in the context of where he was in his life when he was experiencing and witnessing and reporting on the things he was seeing. <clears throat> to me, um, looking at the panel kind of reminds me of uh, old VHS copies of TV Party. <laughs> it's, there's a certain level of spontaneity. There is a, uh, a truth and a witness to the things that are happening but it's contextually relevant to where he was at the time that he was writing that thing. And I think it's a testament to the whole panel that's there that um, the through line is you can be a witness to something, you can be aware of something, you can be conscious of something, but at the same time, you can be in awe of its greatness or its horror. Thank you. Actually, I'm I wasn't brought up in America, so I never heard of him. Uh, but because of this, I'm now curious, and I'd like to see what else he did. And I loved his honesty and his clarity and his humor. I think really his humor is very sharp and beautiful. Thank you. Couldn't agree more. Hi. Hi. I'm Joan Agajanian Quinn, and I was the West Coast editor of Interview during that time. I just want to congratulate you, Linda, for putting this 
wonderful panel together, but for I, me, I, uh, Mike, them, Michael gets the credit. Well, I, Michael, I, I, Michael, then. But Linda, you orchestrated the way people interacted, and I think it was brilliant. Thank you. Um, hi. I wanted to say that I think what, what charms me so much about his work is, is his enthusiasm. So that he's, he's critical, but he's also loving what he criticizes. And, uh, you know, there's a jubilation in that. And at the same time as he's critiquing, he's creating his own art form. And I think it's, uh, you know, it's just a really cool act. <laughs> I mean, a really cool performance that he could yeah. could do all of. That. I like that the word awe came up and enthusiasm, and I also think hearing hearing the different pieces, the kind of um, per permanent amazement. He's always amazed at what he's th seeing and thinking about what he's seeing, you know, and it just ca it it lands on the page that amazement. And the other thing I hear is his generosity. It, it um, when. When we were all starting out in the in the mid seventies, that the, the um, you know life was really cheap in New York then, and everyone supported everyone else, and Glenn was at the absolute epicenter of that. So that um, whether you were a writer, a musician, an artist, he would find what was what was best about you, and he would help you sort of develop that. And I think that was a remarkable skill of his. And I think it shows in his writing, too, in his curiosity about everything. I, he was really, really a generous person. And I just recall, um, Michael, to your point about him being a, a generous person, and you know, obviously curious until the end in 2015 or so, if Purple would host a party that started at midnight and go until five in the morning. And I remember asking him why he was going, and he said, it's my job. And he was always the one I would, I would go to to see kind of what was happening in New York. And this was, you know, way, way beyond his days at Interview Magazine. And I don't know um, anyone um, to this day who was able to keep his pulse on what was going on or keep his finger on the pulse of what was going on um, uh, in a way that he did up until very recently. I, I wa we have to wrap up, but I want to ask each of you one more question be answered very quickly. Now, Glenn was brilliant, but he didn't get everything right all the time. And some of that's in this book. So, Jonathan, I just, each of you, have you ever written something that today really embarrasses you or wish you could take back? Sure. <laughs> you don't have to tell us what it was, but what was it about that that embarrassed you? Well, I mean, I, I guess, I don't know, it's such an invitation to... Um, embarrass myself again, not because it, not by the admission, but by the humble brag that comes with like I know better now, or, um, or I did it out of enthusiasm. But I, you know, I I, I, I blurb too many books. <laughs> it's very embarrassing. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. What was anything really flop that you wish you had done? <laughs> Oh, plenty of things, and they're still swapping. <laughs> uh, I've. I should mention this because I do have a, a business named Sleepy Jones that needs a lot of help right now. That is currently flopping. So if anyone goes to the website sleepyjones.com and needs pajamas, <laughs> it won't be a flop the next time I'm on stage. But I have <laughs> several failed ideas uh, that we don't have time to mention. Yeah, there's far too much um, for me to mention, and I definitely wouldn't be specific, but what I will say is quite often as a young writer, when you're trying to find your voice, you imitate you know, writers you admire, and figuring out that someone who's being really in, in, you know, biting and, and, and clever and even sarcastic 
to strike the right notes on that is very difficult. And so much of the stuff I wrote when I was young was just mean and just bitchy, you know. And I cringe now <laughs> when I think about some of that stuff. Um, you know, how long it can take you to sort of really come into your own as a writer, but especially to figure out the ways to balance, you know, how to critique something that you don't think is good, or that, that you, you really think is horrible, but to do it in such a way that you're not an asshole. <laughs> you know, um, that can take time. And so there's so much that I would never be specific about what it is, but there is so much out there that I'm very grateful that a lot of the early stuff I wrote for the Village Voice and LA Weekly is not online. Um, but yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot. <laughs> well, I've never done anything embarrassing, I'm happy to say, and that's why I'm going to go home and not paint. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you. Thank you all for participating. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>